Let's see. So now we want to we want to go on to our next segment uh, onward and up into the blue skies. And uh, we want to spotlight one of our VPs of business development, Darren Durkee. Darren's going to share his experience and insights for uh, from his Air Force career and take us into the danger zone. Thanks, AJ. We'll go ahead and bring up the slides, Blake. I'm going to be talking to you about the Air Force. I'm going to go through some of my Air Force slides pretty quick. And so I can tell you some war stories towards the end, just some funny war stories that I had. Uh, so this, this talk is about the U.S. Air Force. I graduated from the Air Force Academy back in 1983. And I wanted to talk a little bit about art as well. I spent several years with a couple of tours in the Pentagon and that graphic that you see at the bottom, that's actually a painting. And that painting was uh, done by Robert Emerson Bell. It's called Wings Through Flight. The, uh, the vort vortical center of the graphic is a representative of 1947, which is the year the Air Force became a separate service. And you can see from, from left to right, it's the the Wright Brothers aircraft all the way out to the F-22 on the front. And as new aircraft are developed, the artists will go in and, and update the painting. So this is in the hallways of headquarters Air Force in the Pentagon, and it is one of my most famous works of art. And I got to walk by it uh, very frequently when I worked there. So that's Wings Through, wings through Time. Uh, next slide, Blake. So why do we have an Air Force? Well, 70% of the Earth may be uh, covered by water, but 100% is covered by air and space. So there's a lot to cover. But as you know, and we saw this with 9-11, the uh, air transportation, and, and, and it's responsible for a lot of jobs. You can see the U.S. economy, uh, the global transportation system transports $1.3 trillion and uh, develops 10 million jobs. It's about 5% of the gross domestic product. And and globally, it's it's 35% of the global trade value moves by air and supports 57 million jobs. So our air networks are, are important to our economy as well as our national defense. Next slide. The Air Force was born from the Army. Uh, it was the Army Air Corps, but in 1947, following World War II, uh, President Truman signed the National Security Act of 1947, made the executive order to establish the Air Force as its own service. Next slide. The, uh, who's the uh, person that's considered the fa father of the United States Air Force is Brigadier General William Billy Mitchell. And he was very outspoken on the benefits of air power. He was in the Army Air Corps and uh, he was very instrumental in in moving the Army Air Corps into its separate service as the Air Force. He was a very outspoken general. He got in trouble a lot for speaking his mind. And, and at one point he uh, was brought up for court martial and actually found guilty and was uh, sentenced to five years suspension from the military. And rather than serving that suspension, he, he opted to resign. General MacArthur was on that uh, panel, that court martial panel, and he disagreed with the, uh, the, the assessment and voted to keep him, keep General Mitchell in the Army Air Corps, but uh, he was overridden by the rest of the panel. Next slide. So what's the Air Force mission? It's to fly, to fight, to win, to deliver air power anytime, anywhere in those, in those five areas. And I'm going to talk to each one of those. There's command and control, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, which a lot of my background is in those two, C2 and ISR, along with global strike air superiority and rapid global mobility. Next. As far as C2 ISR, these are the airframes that conduct that. That's essentially the eyes and the ears of our, uh, our forces to determine um, what's out there, where it is, and, and how to deal with it. And the four that you see there from the from the upper left to the RC-135 all the way to the E-38, which is called the Joint Stars. I flew in operational units in all four of those aircraft and, uh, and served over the years flying in all of those as a navigator and an electronic warfare officer. So these platforms are near and dear to my heart, but you also see there's, there's the drones that do surveillance reconnaissance and some of them actually deliver weapons as the MQ-9 does. 
and then the E4 all the way down in the lower right, which is the National Airborne Command Post for the president during crises. Next slide. Global strike, that's delivering, uh, delivering force at long distance. And these are our bombers and our missiles. And I think most of you are familiar with those. We have the B-1 bomber, the B-52, which has been around for many, many years, uh, goes all the way back to Vietnam. My father-in-law flew them in Vietnam. Uh, the B-2 you've heard of flies long global strategic missions. They'll, they'll fly right out of Missouri go drop bombs halfway across the globe and then come back 20 plus hour missions. And then of course our uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Next slide. Then we have air superiority. You probably hear more about these than any other. These are our fighters. And of course, some of these fast moving aircraft also drop bombs. So they do land and counter land and air. But I think you've heard of most of these. The F-15 has been a workhorse for the Air Force for many years, along with the F-16. And now the more newer variants are the new fighters, the F-22 and the F-35. Next. Something I did want to point out um, is I, almost all of these platforms that I'm, I'm going through uh, over these various missions have all been supported by SMA in, in the past. We've been part of proposals for all different elements uh, that have to do with these platforms. So um, you can take pride in knowing that SMA has been a, a uh, valuable participant in the development and procurement of these platforms that help, help in our national defense. And then there's rapid global mobility. Obviously, you can't fight wars or project power without transporting things places. And we've got large aircraft that do that. You've probably heard of some of these. Um, the C-5 is the largest, very big aircraft. The C-17 is the most modern and current one. And that's been recently in the news. If you see the picture in the lower right, many of you probably saw this in the news the last few days. The, that is uh, um, folks that are being evacuated from Kabul, the air, air station there, the airport. And uh, C-17 is taking those folks uh, away from Afghanistan to, uh, to a safer area. So they're in the news day in and day out. Next slide. This just gives you an idea of the number of platforms the Air Force has. Uh, got a lot of fighters and trainers. And then, uh, of course, several airlift aircraft, less in the bomber area. Um, this just gives you a rough, rough uh, thumbnail sketch of what platforms and, and how many. Next slide. And then as far as how the Air Force is organized, there's the Title 10 of the U.S. Code. That is our, our line forces, or our uh, we call the regular forces. And then on the, on the right side of the slide is the Title 32, which is the Air National Guard. And they are a, a major component of the total force. Um, when we go to combat, they, they also provide forces uh, to not only organize, train, equip, as well for uh, air operations. Next slide. We've got lots of bases all over the, the continental United States. The ones that are in yellow or green are joint bases that the Air Force has combined with other services to support. Some of those near my area are the joint, I'm in the Washington DC area. We've got Joint Base Andrews, Joint Base Santa Costia, Bowling and, and Langley Eustis. So still a large presence of Air Force facilities across the United States. Next slide. This slide just shows that every day the Air Force is actively doing uh, operations across the globe. And 55% uh, of our folks uh, in on active duty. And then if you include the National Guard, our total force, 43% of that total force is in direct support of combat operations, which is roughly 220,000 uh, aviators, airmen and airwomen that are engaged every day. Next slide. And then as far as the personnel, this is this slide's a few years old, but it gives you an idea of just uh, the breakdown of our personnel, our force strength, the Air Force's force strength, um, the average years of service and age of officers versus civilians and, and enlisted. And then the pie chart shows a comparison of the rough sizes of personnel across the services where 
we roughly, the Air Force roughly has the same as the Navy, the Army has more and the Marine Corps a little bit less. Next slide. And I, I would be reticent to not to include the newest uh, force in, uh, in the Department of Defense, which is the United States Space Force that was stood up with the, uh, the NDAA, uh, the National Defense Authorization uh, legislation in 2020, uh, redesignated Air Force Space Command as the United States Space Force, a separate force amongst itself. Uh, separate uh, branch. And uh, it, if you look at the chart on the right, it still falls under the Department of the Air Force. This is very much like the Marine Corps under the Department of Navy, where you have the Department of Air Force falls under the Department of Defense, and then you have Air Force and the Space Force both have their own chiefs that, that fall under the Secretary of the Air Force. Next slide. Okay, now we get to have a little bit of fun. Gonna uh, go into some of my war stories here. And I try to pick things that are humorous, but first let's talk about my her heritage. I have a very proud heritage of uh, military in the past uh, in my family. Um, the first one's not really a war related other than I did the math the other day. I knew my father's father was uh, born in the 1800s. I never really did the math. I just did it a few weeks ago and realized that he was actually, I have a grandfather, never met him. He died when my father was 16, but he was born during the Civil War, uh, believe it or not. So um, then my maternal grandfather uh, served in the army in World War I. And up at the top of the slide, you can see his gravestone there. Um, annotating his service. And then what's interesting on the right, I put it on a leather portfolio. That was his name placard and his dog tags from World War I. I have those here, here in my possession and, and those are special mementos. So that's what dog tags look like in World War I, just some those aluminum circles with his name, name on there. And then my father, he served in the Army Air Corps. So that was a predecessor to the Air Force. That was in World War II. And he served in the China Burmese India Theater. He was a weatherman, covert, overtly, covertly. He worked for the Operation Office of Special Services, the OSS, which later became the CIA, where he went into the jungles of Burma, intercepted and decrypted um, messages uh, that were being sent by the enemy, and he received Bronze Star for his for his uh, service. And then he got out right after the war and became an arch prominent architect. And then my, my wife's father, he was a uh, aviator, served as a, a B-52 aircraft commander and received the Distinguished Flying Cross for combat service in Vietnam. And you can see pictures of him down there on the right. And, and he is buried in Arlington uh, National Cemetery, not too far from us. So Karen and I get to visit, visit his grave site on occasion. I'm very proud of him as well. And then myself, I flew for over 4,000 hours across those four platforms that I mentioned earlier, um, which includes service in Desert Storm. I flew a communications jammer, the EC-130s in Desert Storm. I was, for the Joint Stars of the E-8, I was a, a squadron commander, and then I served multiple tours in the Pentagon. And ultimately, my family loved Northern Virginia so much that uh, I curtailed my career a little after 20 years and just stayed right here in, in D.C. and then have been in industry ever since. But I'm very proud of my service of uh, about 22 years in, in the military. You can see my picture as a cadet at the academy. There's another picture of me um, in my flight suit sometime during my career. And then um, and then there's that other photo where I was uh, on a flight, I can't read my writing there, but I think that was in the air base out of Saudi Arabia flying in the, in the Joint Stars um, during uh, Operation Southern Watch, which eventually became Iraqi freedom. So there's so some rich heritage um, amongst myself and my wife as far as military service in our families. Next slide, now to the fun stuff, the war stories. <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about my RC-135 days, and then I'll talk about the AC-130. That's the comm jammer that I flew in Desert Storm. But first, the RC-135, that was my first assignment. I 
I came straight out of the academy to NAV and electronic warfare officer training, and then I was assigned to RC-135s at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, and we did global strategic reconnaissance. We would deploy to uh, bases um, on different parts of the globe, and then we would fly long missions along the borders of countries that we were interested in uh, gathering intelligence from, signals intelligence. And I've just got a few funny stories from, from my five years of flying in the RC-135s. Uh, the first one I'll call uh, Crucadian Rhythm. And, and I'll mention here, I don't have any stories of, we heard some great stories over, the, over all these service talks. I don't have anything that involves any princes or kings or queens, but, but hopefully you'll find some humor in my in my stories here. The first one I call Crucadian Rhythm. Uh, we went on a deployment, we took a flight surgeon with us and his job was to do a study on the circadian rhythm of air crew members. And we fly these long missions, we'd fly different places. We had examples where we would fly out of Alaska, Northern Alaska, go over the North Pole, land in, in the UK, and then do crew rest and then fly back over the North Pole, you know, doing reconnaissance and back and forth, all kinds of different time zones, long missions. The flight surgeon was flying with us on these missions. And after about a week or two of doing that, he, he just said, I, I'm, I'm done. I'm done doing my study. I've just determined that crew members just don't have a circadian rhythm. You, you all just you just medicate with beer in the in the club and and, and he just gave up. <laughs> Um, so that was one funny story. The next one's called Tanker Crew uh, Deja Vu. Uh, There's one time if we flew a long mission, typically what the tankers, they provide us our fuel, they'll refuel us and we'll, we'll fly up to 20 plus hour missions. And that could involve three refuelings where we'll come back from our track, we'll meet up with the tanker, get more fuel and then go back to the, to the coastline that we're flying on. And this was after, so during one mission, we went in brief with the tanker crew because at least the initial crew would refuel us as soon as we take off. So they would brief, pre-brief with us in the, in the, the operations room before we'd go to our planes and fly. So we did the pre-brief with them and then we took off and we flew like an 18 and a half hour mission, got a couple other refuelings from some other tanker crews. And then we landed and we were back in the operations area, bringing our bags back in, getting ready to go back to the, uh, our, our uh, places to sleep and rest before our next mission. And, and while we're in there, we ran into that tanker crew that we had briefed with um, before we took the flight. And, and they were all chippy and cheery going, wow, are you guys flying with us again today, this morning? And then we said, well, well, no, we, we just landed. We're, and they, their eyes just got, <laughs> they had already landed spent the day eating, gone to bed, had dinner, you know, went to bed, woke up and they were doing their next mission and we were just coming back. So, so I thought that was kind of funny. The next one is sometimes we like to play games because uh, we have a lot of sensors and it was highly classified, you know, some of the capabilities we had in the aircraft. And so these, these crews, the tanker crews, they didn't quite know. They just knew they'd refuel us and then we'd run off somewhere and they don't know where we'd go. They could guess, but so we were kind of this mysterious spy plane, if you will. Well, this was back in the day when digital watches were brand new. And I tried to find a picture. I think that's one of the earlier pulsars that I just pulled off the net. And, uh, and we were in, again, one of these pre-briefings with the tanker crew. And, and we took note. We looked at all the tanker crew folks and looked at their wrists and noticed that nobody had a digital watch except for one person. It was the navigator, which makes sense. He wants to have a stopwatch or whatever. So it made a mental note to that. And then we took off and did our mission. And then when we were doing our refueling with them, we just, the pilot was, our pilot was in on the, in on the joke. We all were saying, you know, we've got some interference back here on our sensors tanker. Uh, um, wondering if maybe somebody might have a digital watch on the aircraft and, and you hear this silence on the radio and they go, well, well yes. And, and then we go, yeah, we think maybe it might be coming from the, where the navigator station where he's sitting and more silence, like <laughs> Roger. And they say, well, we need you to have the navigator take his watch off and put it inside the microwave oven. So it's shielded and it won't interfere with our sensors. 
as far as we know, the navigator complied, but <laughs> anyhow, so we got a laugh out of that one. And then, uh, and then uh, this last one I, I call on our wing. Well, here's the thing. I can't really talk about where we went or what we did. You can imagine. Um, but I can show you pictures of when the Russians, the other guys come over and do it to us. And there's a picture of a, a bear. They actually configure their large bear bombers as reconnaissance, just like an RC-135. And they go do the same thing on us. And they'll fly along Alaska, along the coastline and gather signals intelligence, just like we did to them. And of course, we send up visitors that go up and escort them on their wings. So you can envision that maybe we experienced kind of the same thing on the other side. Well, one time uh, the pilot said, I'm going to I'm going to do a little trick with this. And and uh, so he just slowly over time was pulling back on the throttles, just slowing back down because we have a larger wingspan. We flew at pretty high altitudes. And if you get slow enough, you can actually the fighter doesn't have enough lift and it'll start buffeting to go into a stall. And he got slow enough to do that where the fighter actually had to um, accelerate the throttles back up and, and move forward and couldn't stay with us. And so we got a big kick out of that, just kind of doing some mind games with one of our friends that was, was visiting us that day. So that's my RC-135 stories. Then we'll move on to the EC-130. That's a communications jammer. Um, I deployed out of Germany to Desert Storm for that and was there. They only had us in the country for during the war, and then they got us out because they were like, oh, you're spy plane. So countries don't like us to be in their uh, station there. So we were just there during the war, got in there right before and left right after. But uh, my wife, God bless her, which she knew we were going to be in combat. And, and so she sent me a a Game Boy, which was brand new. That was like the newest, latest thing. It was so cool. And she shipped it to me and, and I actually got it. And I was the only one in the whole squadron and no one had seen one before. Like, oh, this is neat. You know, Mario Brothers. And and so we all just played it 24-7 constantly. I'd, I'd go on a mission. I'd come back and there'd somebody be playing. Oh, you want yours back? Okay. It's almost like I had to have a sign up list for the Game Boy. Well, wouldn't you know it after after you know a week or so we went through all the batteries and i mean even the squadron commander was using it everybody are like oh no now what do we do and uh, one of our sergeants said well we do have the emergency battery supplies for all our flashlights so they went ahead and started using that we went through our whole inventory of emergency double a batteries for the flashlights just to keep the game boy playing but it was a good morale booster and believe it or not on the flight home that production uh, timeline Oops. Because of this, some Oops. Birmingham Waterworks customers may temporarily experience a delay in receiving paper bills. Somebody However, that. Customers can always hear their bill or, 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 at W. Uh, appreciate it. But on the way home, I, we went back to Germany, and it, we weren't. I was I was in the back, and I didn't have any mission work to do, so I was actually playing my Game Boy, and it was Super Mario Brothers, and I saved Daisy for those that play the game. I actually saved Daisy on my flight back home. I was so thrilled. It took a long time to get all the way through the game, so I actually got to the end of the game and won. It was it was kind of cool. Next story is called Lord, Where's My Ring? We get into theater. We're going to fly our first mission. We only took three aircraft in, and this was pretty serious. Now that you look back, oh, Desert Storm, we whooped them. It was relatively safe. But going in, they were saying, you know, we thought we brought in three planes with three with crews, and we, we seriously thought we'd probably lose one crew getting shot down. That was at least going in that we realistically thought that. So I was going on my first mission, and I mean, I was the mission crew commander in the back of the aircraft. Um, you're not allowed to wear any any jewelry when you're in the aircraft because you might damage or sever a, a, a digit. So, but I always, I'm kind of sentimental. So I'd always wear my wedding band and, and I would take it off in the aircraft, take it off right before I got on the plane and put it in my flight suit pocket and zip it up. So I did that and we were in there getting all ready, starting engines, getting ready to go. And then I needed something out of my pocket. So I reached in and got it. And then I noticed a glimmer out of the corner of my eye what was that and then I go uh-oh where's my wedding band and I'm looking around in the aircraft it's like oh no this is in the back of a c-130 with all this electronic equipment with 
with the 12 other crew members where I'm their boss and they're staring at me, what's he doing? And I unbuckle and I'm on my hands and knees and they're like, sir, what's going on? I go, well, I, I dropped my wedding ring. And, and if I don't find it, my wife's going to kill me. <laughs> and that wasn't even the worst of it because you're not allowed to operate an aircraft when you've lost something in it because it could get into control devices or it's, it's a safety of flight issue. I, we would have had to postpone or cancel the mission and, and the whole attack package that was flying that day would not execute without our support, our comm jamming support. So here's this whole package. If I don't find this ring, I am in deep trouble. Fortunately, we got everybody uh, unbuckled and they all looked around like, sir, is this set? I'm like, oh, thank God. So, so now uh, we found the ring, we did the mission, we didn't get shot down, all is good. <laughs> And then my final story, I call it bars and stripes. We, we had deployed out of Germany and we went back to Germany. We had the three aircraft. Um, we had two flags. I was, um, I was a second ranking person, at least as far as crew members from our squadron. So um, the first aircraft, the C-130 has like a hatch you can open in the cockpit and stick your head out if you want while you're taxing. You wouldn't do it while you're flying. So we had a plan, American flag and aircraft one. German flag. Actually, we had three German flag in uh, in the second one. And then um, I think it was a Turkish flag in the third one because we were flying out of Turkey during the war. So I was in aircraft, too. I had the German flag. And so we land, we start taxiing and they're opening the hatch. I'm getting the German flag in it. And I realized it wasn't connected to the pole. So I'm going, OK, is it yellow on top, black on top? I don't know what's the right one. And this, and we had a whole, we had the Burgermeister, the, all the German city there at the base, all our wives and spouse, our spouses waiting for us. And I was about to stick the flag out of this hole. I go, I can't get, if I get this upside down, it's going to be an international incident. So we get on the radio, we call the tower, hey tower, this is, you know, this is bolt 36. Do you know, is it black on top or yellow on top for the German flag and silence? So we don't know. You know, some, I said, well, I'm pretty sure it's black. Let's just give it a try. And, and I did it. I did do black on top. It ended up being right. There wasn't an international incident and, and all was good. So, but boy, I was nervous there for, for a little bit. <laughs> Anyhow, so that, that's it for my war stories. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think it's just uh, my conclusion. There's my wife made some lovely. I've got two binders she made for me when I retired of all the patches. There's pages and pages of the patches that I wore on my flight suit as I flew, starting with Academy all the way to the end. So this is just a picture of one of those pages. But um, it's been my privilege to to talk today and talk about the Air Force and hopefully and enjoyed the pitch. Thanks, everybody. Well, well thank you. Thank you so much, Darren. That was, that was incredible. Yeah, Great that was stories. Awesome. And we have to really thank you uh, for your service and also especially your wife as well, Karen. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we moved awesome. a lot. She sacrificed a lot, but um, yes, all, thank you very uh, much. Yeah, as do all service, uh, service uh, persons, uh, spouses too, for sure. Yeah. Great stories. Um, really, particularly, uh, I was fascinated with your days in the River Joint uh, the RC-135. It's a fascinating airplane. It's been around now for, I don't know, four decades, maybe at least. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I forgot to mention, I saw an article yesterday. They're actually flying um, around Kabul, uh, monitoring yeah. to make sure that they're safe there. I saw an article. So they're, they're, they're doing that as we speak. Some amazing, amazing airplanes that have still been in service for over four decades. Uh, uh, the B-52, almost seven decades. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Darren. And thank you to Karen.